the last three or four times I've in, endeavoured to try and get out of two Corinthians because I just wanted to do a couple of one-offs before I went on holiday and when I got back didn't feel like I should do anything else and, then, and again just preparing this week just felt that we should find our way to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 would you uh, we looked at some stuff last Sunday night but this is a three quite important points that the Lord would have us understand this morning Two Corinthians two and verse twelve. Now I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found the Lord opened a door for me. I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there, so I said goodbye to them and went to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal possession and uses us to spread the aroma and the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God a pleasing aroma in Christ among those who have been saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life, and who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Let's just pray, shall we? Father, as we come into your word this morning, would you just open our hearts to receive from you? Father, I just pray that you would speak very clearly. You've already told us, prophetically that for some of us that things are turning and I just pray that as I explain the scriptures that father a word would come to our hearts and for many of us we'd be able to go forward from this place with a new word with a fresh expectation and walking into a new season of your grace in the name of Jesus amen that's important why we're in the house of God because I believe when we're in the house of God yes we can receive from God through our own personal devotions but there are times when a word comes to the house and uh, it stirs us and changes us and pushes us forward and I believe this morning is going to be one of those times. Last Sunday night just briefly we looked at the fact that Paul had got a real heart for the church and there was somebody in the church that caused him a whole lot of grief and he talks about the restoration process and how they need to extend justice and grace and then he goes on to say this, Now I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found the Lord had opened to me, had, had, had opened for me a door. You know, God is great at opening doors. In fact, the scripture says he's the one that opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. Very often, it's us that want to open doors, especially of opportunity, and uh, we find it hard and we struggle. We need sometimes to wait on God that he would open a door or he would close a door. And I just felt as I was preparing this this week, there will be some of us this morning that need God to open a door. And there's some of us that need to understand that God is shutting a door. And there's nothing wrong with that because there are seasons in our lives. Things do change month by month, week by week. I know exactly what Paul means. He said, God has opened to me a very effective door of opportunity. I have watched over the last five years with just complete and utter awe of what God has done for me personally in opening so many funerals. As for many of you know, that I, I, I would do 10, 12 a week. Many, many families, many lives. You think about the memorial services that we've had here some of the Remembrance Day services, we had a big one here last year, but how about the ones that we had in the Mill Theatre? In, in its entirety, I'm, I'm guessing that thousands of people just heard me speak words of comfort and pray to their families. Hundreds and hundreds of home visits. God opened to me an incredible door of opportunity that not only was for ministry, but actually provided for us financially. Thanks be to God. Isn't he wonderful when he does something so wonderful and perfect and clear? But I've also watched with complete awe since January, the Lord shut that door. But the point is, I'm hardly doing any funerals anymore. We have to be careful that we do what God wants us to do. Now, I could get really upset, ring all the undertakers up and say, why am I not getting business? Listen, we need to trust God with our lives. It's not what we can manufacture or make happen. I want to be in the place that God is opening the opportunity or closing the opportunity, but have the grace to see. 
Because some of us, when God opens a door and it's effective and it's wonderful for a season, then God begins to shut it, we start getting angry with God. Listen, he was the one that started to open it in the first place, wasn't he? I thank God for, for an incredible five years of ministry. I'm not saying I won't do any funerals again or that won't be part of my ongoing ministry. But what I'm saying is, to the extent that it was, that door is almost shut. And you, I, I can't work it out. There's no rhyme nor reason to what has happened. But God is doing something very special. And I think for some of you, you need to heed this word this morning because God had opened a door of great opportunity for you or he's been doing something in your life and now it seems to be closing a little bit. Let's not be blaming God. Let's be waiting for the next door to open because he's got our lives in the palm of his hand, hasn't he? Yeah. <coughs> God opens doors and it's our responsibility then to pursue the opportunity. The, cha the challenge for many of us is God opens a door and we don't do anything with it. Well, we'll make an answer before Christ one day for that. Let me tell you, if God is opening a door of opportunity in your life, grasp it with both hands. Because opportunities have a time limit. I've always said this. Opportunities are called opportunities because they only last for a moment or for a season. So whatever God opens in that moment or season, grasp it with all of your heart. So I thank God and I want to go on public record to say thank you Jesus for the last five years of that opportunity and thank you now that you're moving me into a different season. And we thank God for that, don't we? And all of us need to be in that mindset with our own lives that God will open a door and sometimes God will close a door. But whatever God does, that's all right by me because he's for me and not against me. I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went to Macedonia. He had no rest in his spirit. Even in the midst of this great opportunity. For there was such a door of opportunity for the gospel and for doing good. And yet the scripture says he was distressed in his mind. He was restless. He was uneasy in his spirit. And he could not be satisfied to stay. Now, this verse is very challenging on many levels because we're talking about not a novice Christian here. We're talking about the apostle who knows the heart and will of purpose of God in his own life. So let me just highlight a few key points here. Paul, the great apostle, was in a place of effectiveness but not in peace. He was in a place of effectiveness but not in peace. I think sometimes, and I could be wrong, that we automatically think that if we are being effective or successful, that we have to be happy. I want to draw your attention to the biggest single act of grace in this universe and the most powerful point of ministry ever effective, which was the cross of Jesus and his completed and atoned work. It was the most successful thing that has ever happened on this planet. And yet it was one of the most painful experiences. So let's not equate success almost with, oh, we're going to be happy in the midst of the success. I think that's the problem in church. We want to be happy. You can't make yourself happy. Happy is just a, an ongoing process of something that happens when you do the right things. But I, I believe here the apostle was struggling, even in the midst of this great opportunity to see so many people saved and transformed, he really wasn't happy. Maybe you've come to church this morning thinking, well, you know, serving God's just hard work. Listen, it is hard work. Scripture says, if any man would come after me, he must take up his cross, deny himself and follow me. I'm not saying that we won't have good times. I'm not saying that we won't feel blessed sometimes. But you can't always rely on feelings. We're to be obedient, aren't we, to the work that Jesus has called us to. So you can be in the midst of great things and yet not feel. Listen, it's not about what you feel this morning. It's about what God has said. Yeah. It's about our obedience to him and serving him wholeheartedly. And there are days that I feel like getting up and being the pastor of this church. And there's many days I feel like not. But that's not how I feel. But it doesn't matter how I feel. What, what God has called me to do, I will continue to do what God has called me to. So what's happening is Paul out of God's will. Has God opened this incredible door and he's decided not to move into it. Well, the reason he says he doesn't want to stay there is because of Titus. Now, this is a tricky one, isn't it? He doesn't want to stay there because the guy that he's mentoring and training up is not there. He's been looking for him. He's not there. 
He got a vested interest, Paul had, in, in key leaders being developed. And he understood that, you know, God can turn up in any place and that revivals blow in and revivals blow out. But he's looking for this key leader. And I want to say this very strongly. Although we are believing and praying for revival, the church is not built by revival. The Bible says that the church is built on the, on the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. The church is built on key leadership. It's not built on revival. Revivals come and help us get back to that place. But actually, it's key leadership that brings a church into a new day and a new season in God. Always. That's the teaching of the Bible. And aren't you glad this morning that God is not limited to one place? This might have been a great door of effectual work for him, but God is not limited to that one door. God can open many doors and is opening many doors right across our nation right now, I believe. You know, every time anybody mentions a place of revival, you know, they say about the Welsh revival and the Pensacola revival. It's always about a place. But listen to me this morning. It's not about a place. It's about his grace. Because God chooses where he chooses. And most of the places God chooses to turn up in revival have been small little holes that nobody's ever heard of. I think we all, all I, I, I did speak with Dr. Michael Brown at length about what happened at the Bounceville revival when I had some time with him last summer, which was just amazing. And he, he reiterated that story again that he told us on the uh, Saturday that when the people c- came to Brownsville, they didn't even know where Brownsville was. And people would get off the airport in, in Florida and they'd drive the car. And the man at the petrol station saying, you looking for God? He's about 25 miles down that way. God can show up any time, any place he wants to. And we need to be glad this morning. But he goes on to say this. But thanks be to God who leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal possession and uses us to spread the aroma and the knowledge of him everywhere. We should spread the aroma of Christ everywhere we go. Now he's, he's referring to an act that the Romans used to do. The conquering commander, after he captured and defeated an enemy, would lead the uh, the, from the cities of Greece and Rome would lead the captives through the streets to demonstrate his power. So this great man of authority who's won the battle would take all of the enemies that he had and he would, he would parade them through the streets, displaying them and saying, here is my spoils of war. I have won a great victory. So everybody knew how powerful he was. He was walking them and talking them through and saying, This is an example of my victory. And that's what Paul's saying. You know, we are God's victory parade. He's parading us in front of this world and saying, look what I have won. Look what I have gained. Look at those that are mine. And he says, for some we are the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Part of this process as he led the captives through the city was he would use very, very strong perfume. Very, very strong incense was burned in the streets during those times of procession. And the smell was so powerful. You know, smell provokes memories, doesn't it? I don't, I don't know what it is, but every time I smell bacon and eggs, I think about caravan holidays. I, I don't know about you. Or, or you know, you, you walk past somebody and they're wearing brute. and It, it takes me back to me and me and Aid were at camp, you know. <laughs> Because that's all we had then, brute. I've got a picture of me and Aid and my brother on my phone. You can see it after. Man, we, we look wimpy. Thanks be to God that we've grown up a little bit. But, you know, smells invoke emotion, don't they? They invoke memories. They, they invoke a whole lot of senses within us. And I, I guess as they put this aroma into the streets and the people walked about, that the, the, the commander was trying to, to invoke a smell of victory. We're on the victory side this morning. And God is praying in us not as his captives, but as his friends and those that he's purchased by his precious blood. And there's a smell that is being invoked in the nostrils of those who are around that is provoking a response. The scripture says, To the one with the aroma that brings death, to another an aroma that brings life. See, when we water the gospel down, it has no effect, but it's supposed to have an effect. The gospel is supposed to be an aroma, that's what the scripture says. It's either going to be an aroma for life or an aroma for death. One brings ultimate optimism, 
the other brings ultimate despair. The worst thing that we can have when we're walking around and sharing the gospel is apathy. The gospel is supposed to provoke in people one of two things. Either a desire for life because they understand that Christ now is living in us. Or just thinking, this is just a load of rubbish. I don't want anything to do with it. That's why Jesus said, I'd rather be cold or hot. There is no middle ground when it comes to the gospel. This aroma is supposed to provoke one of two responses. That's why we need to be clear with the gospel, isn't it? The gospel is supposed to challenge people. And I'm afraid most of the time, I'm speaking about myself now, that sometimes my witness doesn't really pose too much of a challenge to anybody anywhere, in any way. And I want to be so on fire that I'm either life or death to somebody. At least they either love me or hate me. Either they see Christ in me or they just see, see I'm a complete idiot. But there is no middle ground. We need to be the aroma of Christ to this generation. Verse 17. Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent for God. See, just like in our generation, see, we, we keep on cheering on the early church as if it's something fantastic. Well, the early church had its fair shares of teachers and people who peddled and got on the bandwagon uh, and merchandised the word of God to sell for profit. That's what the scripture says here. Do not sell, peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, he, he goes on about how we speak with sincerity for Christ. But there were so many people in that day and generation that were still using God's word as a platform for making profit for themselves. The gospel is for saving souls and not making money. We need to understand that because there, there is even a, a greater sense, I feel, I mean, I've listened to, to preaching and teaching from all around the world, but there seems a greater strength now in some of the stuff that's coming over from America in particular uh, that is, is so much geared to prosperity um, that it's, it's, it's truly frightening. You know what? I believe in, in God prospering us, believe you me. The Lord's my shepherd and I shall not want. And he's proved it every day that I've walked with him. He's not let us down at any given point. But we're not all multimillionaires and we will not all be multimillionaires. And anybody that tells you that is deluding you. It's not what the Bible says, is it? And right now we just need to understand that the gospel is not for making money, it's for saving souls. Now, there are legitimate expenses to be covered. And I know what Corinthians says in 1 Corinthians about those who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. But there have been two extremes procreated throughout church history. And let me just tell you this morning, you know, to pay the preacher a pittance is a disgrace. And some petty-minded, penny-peaching deacons one day will answer before Christ for their shabby pre uh, work tray they've treated their servants. Thanks be to God for your kindness towards us here who preach the gospel and uh, for your kindness in paying us. Uh, we thank you for it. But there are places where it's almost like keep the pastor uh, poor, keep him under. That is a disgrace and not the teaching of the Bible. But neither is it pay the preacher like a rock star, celebrity culture in the church. That equally is a disgrace. That equally is a disgrace. You know, and, and the parachurch movement in particular, where the preachers have even, not even got a church, but have got their own ministry organisation and title, those kind of celebrities asking you for £30 for a prayer cloth and you send it off and they send it and you get healed, they are charlatans and they are lawyers. So please, please, please do not turn any of the God channels on and get somebody's miracle oil from Israel or their prayer cloth. They are trying to make money. We have the power to go to God ourselves, to read his word, to pray to him and have direct access to the Father. Thanks be to God for his great son, Jesus. We don't, we don't need their prayer cloth. I'll tell you what you can do with their prayer cloth, but I wouldn't because I'm preaching now. But this. We're not here to make money from the gospel. We're here to see people's lives changed. That doesn't mean we don't rightly expense the preachers. Of course we do. But we are here to preach the truth and to see it set people free. The trouble is the money becomes a snare and it becomes like an organisation and some of these boys are treated better than rock stars. In fact, Paul says, on the contrary in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. When you start to understand, when you handle the word of God up here, you're sent from God. It brings a whole huge responsibility with it. 
One day we will answer before Christ for what we have taught and what we have said. Now, there are the odd occasions we have probably not always been as clever as we might have been and might have been out of step with Christ. If that is the case, then we will answer for that. And on many times I've repented of that. And if I end up saying something here that is not wrong, then by the grace of God, once I find out it's wrong, I will put it right again. But we do have to give an account to him whom before we stand. And so this morning, there have been a few things that have come out that I just want to highlight to you again, just as we close. So some of you may respond in your heart. God spoke to us about a new tide turning and turning a new corner. And we've talked about a door of opportunity. And I feel for some of you, God is closing one door and opening another. That's okay. Just be assured that God is with you. And do your best. And if God's opening a door, go wholeheartedly through it into a new season of day of blessing. God's shutting the door, then look for the new door that God is opening and walk through it with the same kind of confidence that you had on the first door. Second thing is this, that we, we, our, our life should be provoking somebody somewhere to something. If we're provoking nobody to nothing, then we, we, we're not truly demonstrating that liberty that we have in Christ. We need to be the aroma of Christ. It's either to life or to death. So I, I'm just examining my own heart and motives this morning. So where, wherever I am, come this week, whether it's doing a bit of consultancy, whether it's been at home preparing my stuff for you, whether it's out with uh, people ministering to them, what am I bringing? Am I bringing life or death or am I just bringing mediocrity? And I, I want to be giving God my best. And then finally, we're not doing this to make money. We're doing this to see lives changed. Amen? Amen. So let's just pray. Father, uh, I pray that your word would dwell in us richly. Amen. Thank you for your word. Thank you. It's life changing. And I just pray right now that that peace would just, uh, of God would come to some people who know that life's just about to change. For those, Lord, that are in new jobs, Lord, we pray. Yeah. Thanks for some of our young folks and who've got new positions. And uh, yeah. Lord, for all of them, especially those that are teaching. Lord, would you help them in a very, very difficult situation now in schools. That that door of opportunity would be a blessed one. Pray that you just be with them. Yeah. Touching them and uh, helping them. For, the, for those that are starting new school, college courses, stuff for our, ki our kids, that you'd bless them. Yeah. There's one door shuts, a new one opens and they go through. Lord, would you be with them and bless them. Bless Josh as he looks again at doing some of his exams. Would you bless him, especially giving him the right work experience, that he might get a job that would be a great job for him. That's the prosperity we believe in, Lord. We believe in walking with you, being obedient, hearing your voice, and letting you direct our paths. So I bless them all, we pray in Jesus' name. And for, maybe for some of us who are older and more mature in years, who are now looking and saying, well, what door is God opening to me? Lord, open, open doors of opportunity to all of us in an incredible way, we pray. And give us the, the grace to walk through them and to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.